I'm very happy to have uh, back uh, Devon Borman and Raz Mafsar. I would like to welcome everyone, all members, viewers to our channel again. Hi, Devon, and thanks for coming and sharing your knowledge with all of us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> How are you, Devon? Everything okay? In, uh, everything, wherever you are? everything is good. Yeah, happy to, to be gradually getting to do a little bit more fencing and things and looking forward to yeah taking on new students and, and continuing to push forward my fencing. Perfect. So we are going to talk about the rapier, uh, Devon. Let us just uh, give us a, a short description. What is a rapier? So our viewers exactly know what we are going to talk about first. Sure. So I think it's um, important to think about where the, the term rapier and how people might think of it from a movie's perspective. So I think very much so when we when people think of rapiers, uh, they often think of a very long thrusting oriented dueling sword. And I think lots of people even think of like the epee and foil of the Olympics when they think of a rapier. Um, and so they think of that very point oriented um, weapon. And um, it's, but the, the term rapier in a museum curation perspective often covers a, a even broader range of swords. Um, so from slightly more simple hilted, shorter cutting oriented swords to very long thrusting oriented swords. And we've got a couple examples I can show up right away just Perfect. to kind of ground us. So generally nowadays when we're talking about rapiers, we're talking about a sword like this one. So it has um, a a complex hilt. So meaning something more than just a crossbar, it has a crossbar. Um, these upper arms, rings, or sweeps, these are called sweeps, sometimes a cup, so it has a lot more hand protection, and, uh, and it's made for single-handed use. Often the handles are even, sometimes get even a little bit shorter um, to, to about this length of sort of the, the palm of my hand. Uh, there's typically protection in the form of this ring to allow you to bring your index finger over ahead of the quillen to cover the ricasso, so that's another aspect of, of what makes something typically defined as a rapier. Um, but also this broader bladed and shorter sword is also a rapier. So uh, it is often called a cut and thrust rapier, although in museum curation, you might not necessarily see that. But you can see again, it has a complex hilt only in so much as it has more than simply the crossbar and the single handed grip. So it has these upper arms, it has a single ring. Uh, so again, it can protect me when I bring my index finger over the ricasso of the sword. Um, and, uh, but you could imagine that the function of these two weapons is actually fairly different. And that when you have a broader bladed shorter, so this one here is about a 35 inch blade. And this other one here is a 42 inch blade. Whoa. So that's a quite, quite a significant difference in their, in their length. And you can think that the, the attitude of fencing, that the shorter, broader one is gonna certainly lend itself to more cutting. Whereas with this longer, narrower one, uh, it's gonna lend itself even more to thrusting. It's been kind of tuned toward that particular usage. So all of that is kind of fits into this broader spectrum of what is a rapier. Uh, and interestingly enough, even historically, rapiers start to, they get incredibly long. There's some uh, museum pieces I've handled. I'm sure you probably have the chance to handle some uh, that are, as, the blades are as long as 70 inches. <laughs> so it's just like ridiculously long. Now, I don't, there's no historical manuals where they advocate having a blade that, that's, that is that long. In fact, they comment on them as being ridiculous. Uh, but I think, you know, when you've got a weapon that is for um, a type of ritualized combat that is dueling and, you know, life is on the line, some people look for the advantages they can. Uh, but there's also, I think, an aesthetic quality in that, you know, um, make, having uh, really long things, you know, exaggerating certain qualities of things as part of your aesthetic is also a pretty common thing across cultures. And so rapiers represented that too. Um, so that's you know, when we're talking about rapiers, we could be talking about anything from a crazy long sword to this more cutting oriented, shorter sword. Um, and uh, when we're talking from a historical or a museum perspective, 
Um, when we're talking from a modern HEMA practice, historical European martial arts practice perspective, typically rapier is referring to these weapons that are between 40 and 45 inches in blade length, maybe a little, actually even 36 inch, some, some people fence are shorter. So 36 inches to 45 inch blade length from the quillin forward, uh, thrusting oriented weapon with a complex hilt, be that a cup hilt or a swept hilt, uh, oriented more towards thrusting fencing. Okay, and then, okay, and now let's uh, d discuss that as we know for HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts, as I have learned, in different discussions with you and colleagues, there are many manuals and treatises. So as I have heard also from you, there are also many on uh, rapiers, right? Mm -hmm. So can we say that, the, I mean, do we have a number? How many manuals of rapier are there? I mean, you know, I think it depends, on, it, it depends on where you start counting. Yeah. Um, and so if you, if you were to only count manuals from Agri Camillo Agrippa forward, so Camillo Agrippa is, uh, wrote a manual in the 1550s, and he's often considered to be the sort of great grandfather of modern fencing. Um, and he is the, the first documented master to uh, really abbreviate the, the fencing uh, of the time to a much smaller subset of guards. Uh, and, and tactics oriented towards dueling. So if we were to sort of make that our definition to say, okay, from 1550 forward, uh, and then on the far end of that, we were to say that, you know, somewhere around, you know, 1700, um, the weapon and the context of its use maybe trans changes enough that it's, um, uh, that it's becoming no longer a rapier, but something we call a small sword. So it's shortening in length, becoming even more point oriented, um, uh, a little bit more, there's kind of a, starting to be more of a move towards fencing in sport versus dueling in earnest. Um, so, you know, say somewhere in, in early 1700 is where it ends. Um, I think that we're looking in the, the neighborhood of probably across Italy, Spain, um, England, France, Germany, I think there's probably somewhere around 60 or 70 manuals. Oh, lots. Okay. Now, let us just uh, uh, discuss that. Can we, as far as uh, schools are concerned, you know, um, I know many of uh, people who watch this channel, or some of them at least come from traditional Japanese swordsmanship, for example, guys, we know that Kachori, I mean, the, the way even Chiburi changes from one school to one another school. But, you know, some, some schools of swordsmanship in Japan are more heavy cut oriented. Some of them are less heavy cut oriented, or some of them are more trusting oriented than cut and many different mm -hmm. things. So could you also help us for um, rapier schools? Can you give us some major schools of rapier in Europe so our viewers understand it better? Sure. So there's there's definitely some cultural distinctions that we see. So and, and I think it's very easy as modern practitioners to for us to um, lump things together under kind of nationalistic boundaries that maybe fit to our modern sense of these places now. Um, and so uh, so I'm going to give a little bit of this with a grain of salt. There is definitely a seems to be a kind of a shared vocabulary of fencing of Italian fencing. And so there is, and we can, I can get a little more granular there in a moment, but there is definitely a particular set of principles that seem to be at play in most Italian fencing. And that's probably um, not because of them being part of the same school, but because them kind of fencing in the same pool. Um, there's definitely a distinct school of Spanish fencing. And there's really kind of two different schools there. There's something often called the vulgar tradition of Spanish fencing. So this is a little bit more practical, more soldier oriented. And then there's a, a noble um, fencing tradition often called the true art or la verdadera destreza. Um, so that's the true art of fencing. It's kind of more the noble educated class of fencing. Um, we see there is, um, uh, uh, there, as far as you know, rapier in there are definitely some some masters that um, uh, within within Germany there's a lot of adoption of Italian fencing, and so we see a lot of implementation interpretation of Italian fencing. Um, there is a a um, a fencing a, you know a, a 
tradition that is called rapier fencing that to me looks more like something I put in this pre-1550 era. Um, but Meyer, Joachim Meyer, who's uh, um, an Italian fencing master, has a section. He's one of the few fencing manuals that actually refers to the weapon as a rapier. Uh, and, uh, and it is much more of a cut and thrust oriented system of rapier, but with a much greater emphasis on having the weapon presented forward, uh, as opposed to having the weapon withdrawn or chambered in some way, but actually presented forward. So he definitely is part of a very long German trans tradition. Uh, he's at the end of this tradition called the Lichtenauer tradition, which is definitely a, a more, more likely thing in Japanese swordsmanship, more of a scholastic or, or master oriented tradition. Um, there is, uh, there are French fencing manuals, there are uh, Flemish fencing manuals and Dutch fencing manuals, um, but I don't know that any of them, you know, I'm not expert in all of those, but many of them, um, as far as, you know, showing something truly distinct, um, they tend to have a lot of commonalities to what we see in the, either the Spanish true fencing school or in the Italian schools. Mm -hmm. Okay, let us start uh, with uh, guards. Can you show us some guards with a rapier? What type of guards do we have? Sure, yeah, let me uh, tuck, tuck this chair out of the way here. So this is where I can start speaking to a little bit of these different schools of fencing. Uh, so we have, uh, I would say that in general, there's a few different uh, ideas that we see of how to stand with the rapier. And this is where we start to get some distinct classifications between these different more schools. Yes. So um, one are reclined postures. So this is more of a classical Italian or rather a um, uh, historical Italian fencing posture, more classic to that era and that period and that style. So here I have my body withdrawn. So my upper body is withdrawn. My hips are pulled back. My weight is more towards the back foot. And in this way, I can pull the front foot away very quickly. I'm really minimizing targets to the upper body. I'm minimizing targets to the hip. I'm placing my sword directly in front of the most presented target. So if the opponent wants to go to here, they have to go through the hilt of my sword and through the stronger part of the blade. Yes. So this is one of the kind of classic ways of standing. Um, we do have then in the Italian systems as well, the other is fencing with the head pushed forward. And now most people who are fencing here are also going to push their head forward at some point. Uh, but there's a, a school of thought that was really strongly um, brought about by a master named Salvatore Fabris. And that involves fencing in a tucked forward position at all times. Uh, although he does show all these different guards as well, but he advocates for being here tucked in behind the hilt of the weapon. So here the face is most closely presented. So the hilt and the sword are in front of the face. And again, the rest of these targets are withdrawn from the opponent. The offhand is used in rapier. So most uh, masters advocated presenting and either holding it by the face, holding it up by the arm, holding it in the middle of the body so that it can push aside the opponent's thrusts. So those are a little bit about sort of core, core uh, that often represented as seen as being part of the uh, Italian school. But there are Italian fencing masters and masters in other areas that stand um, more even weighted. Oh, okay. So in a more even weighted position, certainly what's advocated to being more even weighted is that uh, you're a little bit more set to go front and back. There's not as much weight shift required to make like a retreating step. So there's yes. that ease of movement. Um, I think for some, it's also, if you're inclined to be, you think you're going to be dealing with somebody who's going to be cutting more, it can be a little more useful to be even weighted because you can pivot on that back foot more easily. So you can turn the torso to meet powerful blows. Yes. Um, there is then kind of the next area of fencing are people who are standing much more upright. And so even within, again, the Italian school, uh, there's a guy named um, Giacomo uh, De Grassi, who is somebody who became more popular in England than he did in Italy, um, he advocated a much more upright posture um, with the legs, with some distance between the legs, and then holding the weapons um, a little bit closer or more withdrawn, um, yeah. and, uh, and then moving around on the circle a little bit more, whereas a lot of the um, continental Italians in that time, so this is, you know, kind of late 1500s, early 1600s, are, are moving on the circle, but tend to be looking at the straight line and aligning themselves to this one-on-one -on -one fighting line. 
Uh, then, as we get to the Spanish school, we see even more of that idea. So this idea of bringing the feet together, holding the body upright, and presenting the weapon straight out from the shoulder. Yes. So part of the advocacy for this is they often call right angle. So you can see I'm forming a right angle. It's again that I'm presenting, presenting my sword in its most threatening position. I'm protecting my upper body, my face and shoulders um, with the weapon itself. And I'm also allowing myself to move most naturally by being upright. And so I think also there's a cultural aspect to, um, to fencing in, in this upright way and that this might be seen as more noble, uh, whereas these positions are a little bit more athletic. They're more, I'd say the their masters would advocate that they're more scientific in that they reduce more targets, they present more threat, they're more optimized, <laughs> um, but they also have a different kind of bearing. They have this athletic sort of bearing. Um, so then when we see the Spanish school is we see much more upright and a greater emphasis on moving around the circle, around the opponent, cutting off angles. Um, and, and there's still movement of the sword into angles like this, but the core presentation is here. And then we see a little bit more of an emphasis often in those schools on spirals of the sword um, versus in the Italian schools, there's a little bit more emphasis on creating angles um, over, although this is true of both schools, the reality, but being a little bit more constant with the weapon um, versus moving in circles, which is something that shows up a little bit more in the Spanish school. Yes, could you please explain that? You know, it's so fascinating for me. Because I was talking to a colleague, I'm sure, you know, Ton Pui in Spanish. Yeah, yeah. And he was exactly saying the same thing. Okay, but this interview was in Spanish, right? For those guys who yeah. don't know Spanish on our channel, most people don't understand English. The reason is so fascinating for me. The Spanish, when they move their weapon, you know, we yeah. see the same moves in many Filipino arts. When they fight with, with blades, I'm not talking with, right. uh, with, uh, with sticks, when they fight yeah. with barong or when they fight with any bladed weapon, you see the same move in Filipino martial arts. And Ton was saying that we need to do more research because there is Filipino martial artists say, at least, that they were mm -hmm. influenced by Spanish. It's just a note right. because you said this spirals, it's a uh, very, could you tell us more about spirals, please? I'm so fascinated by that. Sure. So I think one thing I can show with my sword dummy here is I can show a little bit yes. of this. I'll even show a little bit kind of a you're holding the sword perspective here. Yes. Um, so um, one approach, and this is the reality is this isn't, I, this approach is valid to both Spanish fencing as well as Italian fencing, which okay. is that as I approach my opponent, who's so a core thing of rapier when we get to the dueling era is that most, pretty much everybody, this is the big shift, says stop holding your sword back start holding your sword forward. Okay. Present the point of the weapon, present your capacity to control with the weapon. Um, the removal of the weapon from that space is less of an advantage than being already proximal with the point. And you can think of this in a situation where you're only fighting one person. So you know where they are, yes. you know what they're armed with. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you're not needing to save anything in reserve. You're not needing to make big cuts to fend off multiple people. Yes. And you also know that the person's not armored. So you're going to be able to use this weapon to pierce them very easily. Even if they just walk onto the sword, they're going to be grievously injured by it. So you gain a significant amount of advantage by presenting the weapon forward. And this is one of the things that Agrippa really showed. He was like, let's get rid of all these guards where the weapon is chambered in all these different ways. And let's just put it out here in one of four different positions. And there's thumb, basically thumb down, palm down, thumb up, palm up, are the four positions that Agrippa um, gives us and that are still true to um, modern fencing now. Uh, uh, um, Devin, Devin, I know you, know, yeah. you as an expert are very familiar. Could you just show us these four positions to our viewers again, please? Sure, yeah, and then I'll, I'll bring that back in here in a moment. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Keep going on little sidetracks. No, no problem. Um, <laughs> so the four hand positions are yeah. here. Mm -hmm. um, so this is like knuckles up or thumb down. So, mm -hmm. and I'm just showing it without the body posture because it could be, there's so many different ways this might sure. be held, but all of these are this first position. Okay. okay then there's palm down. Okay, typically done at the height of the shoulder. Okay, so this in Italian is prima, but it just means first. Seconda just means second. Then here in this kind of, sometimes it's called a neutral position, but this is like thumb up 
or you can see my fingernails to the inside okay, my the heel of my hand over top of the weapon typically, mm -hmm. okay, but held here with the, the quill and straight up and down the true edge towards the floor and then palm up, oh. typically at the height of the shoulder, but all of this if we considered the fourth position. So yeah. one, two, three, four. four. Yeah. So and then there are many different accompanying body positions. Um, and there are hybrid positions. And so sometimes masters are advocating positions that are kind of halfway in between, halfway between <sighs> the phone day. Yeah, so halfway between second and third. There's this something even called second, third. You know, there's something a halfway position here. Um, and some of those are influenced by the way that the weapon is gripped. And I think that those are, you know, if we want to look at things that start to make the schools of rapier fencing perhaps a little bit more distinct in certain ways, um, sometimes changes in how you hold the sword really shift um, what you can do with the weapon. And so one of the more distinct ones, a guy named Gerard Thibault, who has a manual from the, the mid 1600s, he actually, see here, this is mean in what's often called an Italian grip. So one finger over the ricasso, the yes. thumb here on the opposite side, touching to the ricasso or touching to the index finger. So Thibault actually advocated that this thumb be on the other side of the grip. So the sword is actually held this way, kind of pinched between the thumb and the index finger. And so you can imagine how this changes how the weapon, in fact, it puts almost the flat of the sword against the heel of the hand. So here, so my weapon's more on top. Whereas here, he's more in beside. And now Tipo is one of the fencing masters that we actually have documentation of him doing demonstrations in public squares and challenging other fencing masters. And essentially everything we know about him is he was clearly a, a true master of fencing in his time. Um, and so there's certainly something to be said for what he's doing. Uh, but yeah, he's holding the weapon in quite a different way. Although he also does change his grip and he often calls it, this is more advocated as the cutting grip. And whereas this is the grip that's being used to uh, subjugate the opponent's weapon, to, to get control of it. Yes.